So imagine for a second, you're new to guns, you've probably taken a couple of classes, so you know how to actually handle the gun. You probably already know your state laws and things like that. And you have a carry gun. It doesn't matter if it's a Glock or whatever handgun that you have. And maybe there seems to be something that's kind of missing from it. And a lot of times, if you push through those things, you'll eventually maybe forget about them and you develop like these compensation methods that might work, but maybe they don't work the best. And I'll explain more about what that means in a minute. It could be the way that it feels when you're gripping it. It could be when your hand starts sweating, the texture that comes with the gun doesn't actually work anymore. It could be the way your sights align, you can't see your target. It could be, it could be a multitude of things. So what does it actually mean to rig up your carry gun? To me, and for the context of today's video, I look at it as taking your carry gun, your holster and your belt and making a seamless system that fits not only your hand and your eyes and your trigger finger, but also your body the best. And today we're gonna cover the handgun. And then in the next video, we'll talk about the holster and the belt. And so I wanted to take you through the process of the five things that I look for whenever I get a new handgun. How do I get it ready for a concealed carry? Meaning, how do I make sure that the gun has everything that I need or things that I feel that are important when I'm carrying it? And then not only that, how I address the things that kind of bother me about it. I just wanted to let you guys know that there will be a parts list for today's video, but if you follow the first link in the description or the link that's pinned in the comments, It'll take you to a blog post on my website and there will be a parts list for all the things that we're gonna be talking about. And there'll also be promo codes over there. That way you can get some money off. That's over there, just in case you want it. Let's stop wasting time. Let's just jump into the video. So I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I've noticed this over the past few years of being into firearms. I'm not an expert, I'm just an enthusiast on YouTube. So don't let the subscriber count fool you. I'm not an expert. I'm just a guy that's just gonna tell you like it is. And if I'm wrong about it, people like to call me out in the comments. That doesn't bother me at all, guys. Feel free to call me out for any mistakes I make. I'm just a human and I'm just a one man show here on YouTube. There's nobody else helping me with this channel. So sometimes I forget things and I overlook things and during editing, I forget stuff too. So keep that in mind. So I don't know if you guys have realized this, but there is a huge difference between the way that a gun feels when you're dry firing it and presenting it versus real world live fire. And for example, what I mean is there's been multiple occasions where I picked up a gun that felt amazing in the hand to dry fire, got to the range, didn't feel so amazing. Also the opposite, um, there have been guns that I dry fired that didn't feel all that amazing, but once I got to the range, it felt even more amazing. So let's just suppose you get your new gun home, you go to the range and you shoot it. The first thing that I look at is how well I can grip the pistol. Now, there is something to be said about developing arm strength so you can really hang on to it and also developing the proper grip technique and you know putting pressure and kicking elbows out and all that stuff. If you want more information about that, uh, go check out John Lovell's channel at the Warrior Poet Society. He has amazing videos on properly gripping a handgun. So assuming you have all your proper grip down, let's suppose that for some reason you can't mitigate recoil and your left hand just keeps breaking up like this no matter what you do. How do you solve that? In my experience, grip is the most important thing on any handgun. I think grip, having the right texture and the right ergonomics is more important than having the right trigger or the right slide. If you can't hang on to your gun, you're not gonna be very good with it. That's why I wanted to address this first. So if you watched my previous video from two years ago about how to choose your first handgun, one of the things that I stated in that video is the MMP 2.0 is probably one of the most underrated handguns that I think is even available in the market. For example, this guy right here, this is the Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 compact. That's also, that's modular optics. So you could put any optic you want on it. And it also has front serrations right here. The reason I bring that up is this gun is literally like $529 and it comes with suppressor height sights already included, which many modular optics handguns don't. But I've built this up over the past couple of weeks, and this is gonna be the main example that we're using in today's video, but we will be covering other guns in examples as well. So for grip, this gun is one of the few handguns that I own, and I own quite a few. Um, you can go back and watch, if you're new to this channel, just go watch a lot of my old videos. We got videos on almost everything. Not quite everything, but a lot. This gun has the best grip texture from the factory, bar none. There's nothing you need to do to this grip texture. Maybe if you wanted, you could have some indexing points stippled in right here. 
you know, similar to this, but the texture is amazing. You can grip it and you can really hang on to the sucker and get some really good shots off. But suppose you didn't get this gun. Suppose you got this gun right here. This is a Gen 5 Glock 17 MOS. I will say one thing, I don't like the Gen 4 or the Gen 5 texturing. It's just not enough. It works great until my hand starts sweating. And then after that, my support hand here starts sliding like this. And you can look here and see with this gun, when I got my support hand in there, it doesn't slide as much because that texture is so aggressive that it doesn't allow it. So one thing that you could do to this is you can get a set of Talon grips or you could get a set of these guys. These are called handle lit grips. They're basically the same thing and they have different textures. I prefer the rubberized texture, but they also have some that's like skateboard grip tape. And you could take these, you can put them onto any gun. They make them for all these different guns or pre-cut. And you can even get pieces that go up here for you know putting your thumb here. Um, for recoil mitigation, which we'll talk about more about here in a minute. But this is a quick and dirty and cheap way to dramatically improve the grip of your handgun. Another thing you can do to improve the grip of your handgun, and you'll notice a theme amongst all these guns that I have here, almost, all, almost all of them. What is one thing you see in common with all of these? It's a magwell. You know, for full-size guns, you don't really need a magwell unless you got giant mitts like Hickok 45. But if you have like a compact size gun, say like this Glock 19 MOS, having this right here really pushes your hand up. And so whenever I go to the range, even though this gun and this gun have the exact same grip texture, I'm able to shoot this gun a lot better just because my pinky is wedged up in there and it doesn't slide as much. One way you can address your grip is adding a magwell. If you find your hand sliding a little bit during recoil, because when your hands start getting oily and sweaty, there's not a whole lot you can do if the grip texture isn't good. So you could do both. You know, in the example of this guy, you know, I have both this grip tape as well as the magwell, and it really helps me hang on to it. Another thing you could do is sending your gun off to have it textured. Now this started its life as a Glock 19X. The gun was originally the Coyote Tan. Rocket City Stippling did this. I have a full video on this gun if you wanna watch it later, but had them Cerakote it in sniper gray and they stippled through it and they did an amazing job and they put all the texture in the places where I wanted it. And so we have these guys right here that help me hang on there. We have a little bit under here so that my fingers don't slip and they just did a bang up job. Now the downside to sending off your gun to have it st stippled is you gotta send it off. And it might take up to eight weeks, just depending on the company you choose, to get your gun back. I always say, if you don't have at least two handguns, meaning you got one that you can keep carrying while you send the other one off, I don't ever recommend sending them off. There are other options that are have a little bit of a quicker turnaround, like getting laser stippling. We are gonna be reviewing some laser stippling in the coming future. So if you wanna see that coming up, uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button and then make sure you hit all notifications because a lot of the times when I post these videos, especially when I'm doing a review uh, for a company that does stippling, their wait times go through the roof just because we have so many subscribers. So that's the downside to it, but I love it to death. Maybe the grip texture is decent for you, but maybe your hand, let's just say for example, you know, with Glock, they have all these different back straps. Maybe none of those back straps really work for you. Maybe they're all too big, even without a back strap. Maybe it's too big in this direction for you. Or maybe your handgun doesn't even have removable or interchangeable back straps. Well, then you can do something called a grip reduction. And that's what's done on this frame. This is a Glock 34 I built back in 2018. And I had this done by Risen Gunworks. So if you look at this frame, let me place these on top of each other so you guys can see it better. Uh, you can really see how they slimmed this up. You notice that they made it really skinny up top and they made it a little bit more narrow, I believe. Not too much, but a little bit, but they really skinnied up the grip. They added my texture down here, added my texture and a thumb ledge there. And this feels like night and day difference compared to a stock grip. 
The next thing that I look at are the sights and whether or not I intend on running a red dot on the handgun. Most guns today, with a few exceptions, no matter what they are, can be milled to have a red dot placed on them. Um, but I try my best to buy guns that are already cut for an optic and then that way I can just throw one on or not. So let's talk about sights. If you've owned any Glocks or anything, you'll know that the sights suck on them. And there's a lot of guns where the sights aren't that great, but Glocks are in particularly the worst sights you can get for a handgun. The Gen 5 sights are a lot better than the Gen 3 and Gen 4, but they're still made of plastic and they can still break. So when I'm looking for sights, I have to ask myself a couple of questions. Number one, am I gonna run a red dot or am I not? If I'm not, I'm gonna get standard height sights. If I am, I need to get suppressor height sights so I can co-witness with it. And that, what that means is if this red dot goes out, I can still get a sight picture without the dot appearing. And that's just in case your battery dies or your red dot fails. Everybody has a different taste profile when it comes to sights. For example, with these sights that I have on here, I have tritium white dots in the back with a tritium white dot in the front. Some people don't like any dots in the back. They find that it distracts them where they can't focus on the target. And so they'll do something like this setup where you have a blacked out rear and then it has a white front. Now, one that I've really been enjoying as of recently, this is the Shadow Systems MR920. And what I like about this is they include a photoluminescent green, uh, meaning if you charge it with light, it can be seen at night. And it also has tritium in it. And then you have a serrated blacked out rear. The reason that people like serrated on the rear sight is it prevents glare in case there's a light coming from behind you like the sun or some other really bright light source. So some people like the green when they're running a red dot and then that way they won't get the red dot mixed up with say, whenever people run colored sights, if you're not gonna run a red dot, I always prefer orange, but if you are gonna run a red dot, I prefer green. That way you don't get the red dot and the color of the front sight mixed up. Let's suppose you bought this gun right here, and this gun comes with suppressor height sights, but as you can see, you have three dots, three white dots in the rear and a white dot in the front. Well, if you just don't like the dots in the rear, take a magic marker or some black paint, dab it in there and you can black it out. That's the cheapest way to do that. If you don't like these and you want like some tritium, then there are options and I'll have links over at the parts list for different types of sites you can get for different types of purposes. If you're like me and you wanna run a red dot, then suppressor height sights are a must. Then, you know, when it comes to red dots, I, you know, I prefer two brands for concealed carry or self-defense. I like Holosun and I like Trijicon. Trijicon, there's nothing wrong with them. Love them to death, they're a little bit more pricey but Holo Suns are amazing. The 407K, 507Ks, 507C, 407C. I, those are the only ones I've tested. I am gonna test more in the future, but absolutely love a solid red dot system because it takes away having to align your sights. You just put the dot on the target and press the trigger. The third thing that I look at is the trigger. And let me explain this a little bit more. So let's talk about why you might wanna change your trigger. Um, this is a factory stock Glock trigger. Nothing's been changed in this gun at all. You'll notice that you got your trigger safety blade. That's right here. A lot of times when you're shooting the Glock, that safety blade really digs into your index finger and can give you quite a good blister, but over time it can give you a nice callus and you won't even know it's there. One way you can get away with that is if you go to Johnny Glock's uh, YouTube channel, he has videos on how to shave that blade down so that it sits flush. But let's just say it ain't even the blade. You'll notice that the front of this trigger blade is curved or otherwise known as radius, so it's curved around but maybe like a flat face, you know? So that's when you would start looking for aftermarket options. For me, I don't like radius triggers because I find that my trigger finger tends to push the gun one way or pull it the other way. Whereas with a flat trigger, I can pull it straight more easily with less mental effort on focusing on my trigger pull. Another reason you might wanna change the trigger is maybe it's too heavy, the pull weight and everything. Maybe it's just crunchy and grindy you know, that'd be another reason to change out your trigger or just do a polish job. There are many videos on trigger polish jobs, so I would suggest researching those because they can take a stock trigger, make it feel a lot better. But if you're dead set on changing it, 
Here's my top three favorite aftermarket triggers. Now this is something that you're really gonna wanna check your local and state laws about uh, just to verify if these can be changed legally. There's a lot of debate. I encourage you to watch other people's videos regarding this topic, not just mine. There's no federal laws that say you can't change out your trigger, but some states might have it. And then there's also the argument, well, just cause you can doesn't mean you should. That's always valid. One thing I will say for the MMP 2.0, the one thing that I absolutely hate about it is it's stock trigger. It has this hooked thing with a hinge and it's just not good. So Apex recently released this guy. This is the Apex Flatty, but it's a polymer shoe. The reason they did that is the original Apex Flatty was about $170, $160, and it was made of CNC aluminum. These can be had for less than $100, especially with the promo codes that I have over at the parts list for you. And I wanted to test it and compare it against the aluminum. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's totally worth the money. They got all the different colors and it feels almost exactly the same. So let me show you this. It's pulling at about three and a half pounds. In the kit, when you get these triggers, I mean, if you go to their website, they have a chart that shows you all the different springs and combinations of springs and what the pull weight will be. You can actually have this go as low as like two and a half pounds, all the way up to like six pounds if you want to. And it makes it a striker fire gun as close to a 1911 trigger as humanly possible. So if you have an MMP, 100% prefer that. However, Overwatch Precision just released a trigger for it. I'm waiting for one to arrive. So we will be reviewing that one in the future but I haven't tested it and I can't speak for it yet. When it comes to Glocks, there's basically three triggers that I really prefer. Number one, for a good duty or carry trigger, I prefer the Apex Tactical Trigger. They have them for Gen 3, Gen 4, Gen 5, Glock 42, Glock 43, all of the above. One thing I like about Apex is they'll legitimately drop their guns from 50 feet in the air, destroying the gun, just so they can get it on high speed camera to see what happens. I'm sure there are other trigger companies that do that, but they're the only ones where I actually have verification and I know 100% that they, they can. And also there's a lot of police departments that allow their officers to carry Apex triggers. They got a lot going for them. Their Glock triggers don't drastically change the characteristics of the trigger like the M&P does, but it does clean it up a lot and you can change out your connector back here with like a minus connector and it's gonna be so much smoother. But here's the way it looks. There we go. All right, so that one's got like a standard connector in it. And then this one on this gun, I have a really light connector in it. So this one's probably pulling at about three and a half pounds. This one's probably foiling at about four and a half, five pounds. So it all depends on what you're comfortable with. Cool thing about Glock triggers, as well as these MMP triggers, you can manipulate them and get your pull weights exactly where you want them. The other Glock trigger that I prefer is the Overwatch Precision Trigger. I would rank them up there with Apex Tactical. I don't know everything that they do in regards to testing, but I do know that multiple police departments also allow their officers to carry these. I think that they're a little sexier, you know, aesthetically, but they feel almost identical and it's all gonna depend on personal preference. Probably about a four pound pull on this. Take a break. Love them to death. They also make triggers. They got one coming for the MMP. They also have them for like my Walther PDP right here. Look at that crap. That's amazing. They also make them for the CZP10C. The third trigger that I really love for Glock is the Timney Alpha trigger. Now I talked about this trigger in a previous video and if you are gonna run these triggers, do not put any lighter springs in your gun unless you're running competitions. Also, don't even change out the connector, just run the stock connector. If you do, it's gonna to be too light. This trigger is literally pulling at about three and a half pounds. And it's amazing. You can shoot really fast with this trigger and you do have to be careful with it. So when you're presenting out, you know, when you go to prep the trigger as you're coming out. Oh yeah, it's scary.
All right, so I think the moral of the story is lighter triggers are easier. I'm just kidding. You've got to practice with this before you carry it. But if you can be proficient with it and prep the trigger without pulling through, it's the most amazing trigger for the Glocks that you can buy. It's very comparable to what uh, Apex did on the M&P, but for Glock. Number four is the weapon light. When I first started carrying, I didn't carry a weapon light, but as I got more experienced and started realizing I might not always have an ambient light to identify if there's a threat, having a weapon light is very important. But not all weapon lights are created equally. So with weapon lights, a lot of people like to focus on the lumens and how bright they are. I only have three criteria for lights on a handgun. At least 500 lumens or greater, you know, obviously, brighter is better. Be shockproof and waterproof. I want to be able to make sure that, you know, as I'm putting rounds through these guns, that these triggers, they're not screwing up and stopping working. And I also want to make sure they're waterproof in case they get wet, they're not going to stop working. You know, obviously I like to look at battery light. So my favorite lights to date are still the Enforce lights. Now you can't buy these small ones anymore because they're redesigning them and they're coming out with a new one and they've discontinued these. But I do have the Enforce Wild. Uh, right here. Now this one is, I believe, a thousand lumens or so, but what I like about these so much more than any other light that you can buy is the way that you actuate them. And the way you actuate them is with this. You just push the thumb, index finger, you just push a paddle, a quick flick, turns it on, press and hold, gives you momentary. Same thing on the smaller light. They are, like I said, they are coming out with a, a new version of this, which will be aluminum and similar to this one. But I like the way that you press these because when you're out here, it's just so much easier to press that than it is for these other lights that I'm gonna mention in a second. The other light that I like is the Surefire X300. This is a classic. Uh, these are quite expensive, but I do know where you can get these for like $75 off. I'll have a link at the build list. You can just push straight in for momentary like that, but you can't do a side switch, kind of like Enforce. You can't put it, you gotta push it straight forwards or you have to pull it down on this side, or you could even push it down over here. Um, it doesn't really matter, it's on a swivel, it can go either direction. These are about a thousand lumens as well, and they have pretty decent battery life. The other light that I just started liking is the new TLR7A from Streamlight. Now, I had the original TLR7 that didn't have these switches on the back, where you had to reach all the way up here, it felt like, just to actuate it. I hated it, I actually sold it. And I rarely sell guns or gun parts, but that one, I just couldn't stand it. So now they got this new one that has these new switches here, and these are so much better. Now these you actuate by pushing down, and if you press and hold, you get momentary, quick flick, you get constant on. And you can do it from either side, either with your index finger or your thumb, just depending on which hand you have available. These are my favorite lights. You know, obviously you're gonna have to get a holster that accommodates these lights, but these are my three favorites. I really love this guy right here. This thing is a tank. But if you want something for concealed carry, I would wait for the new M-Force, uh, the small version to come out, or get something like this TLR-7A. You know, Olight makes some good weapon lights, but the thing I don't like about them is their mounting system. Over time, I've noticed that they start getting wobbly, and I don't like that. It bugs the crap out of me. And number five is recoil mitigation. For most 9mm handguns, you're not gonna need any type of modification, recoil mitigation. And there's actually modifications that you can get that don't involve compensators or ported barrels and things, but those are some options which we'll discuss further in a second. But there are a few handguns that are out there, at least in my experience, that seem like they would be perfectly fine to shoot, but they tend to have more recoil or more snappiness than your standard compact size nine millimeter. For example, my HK VP9. This is a gun that I absolutely love. It is a phenomenal gun to shoot and it feels amazing. The problem is it's a very snappy gun. I'm going to show you why. And then we're going to talk about steps that I take to mitigate that. Earlier, I mentioned that I bought this HK VP9 and it was a lot snappier than I thought it was gonna be. And that has to do with how high the bore axis is, how high the barrel is over wherever the webbing of your hand is, say it's right here. And so I sought out to do some things that would help mitigate the recoil. First thing I did is I bought this Magwell. We kind of talked about this earlier. It helps you get a better grip on the gun, but also when the gun goes to recoil up like this, your pinky grabs onto the uh, Magwell. Also, you can really cant it down when you lock your wrist and it helps mitigate recoil even more. Also talked about grip texture. 
that will help you a ton with recoil mitigation, especially if you do something where you can get this guy right here. You get the little shelf right up here. Now, suppose you haven't bought a gun yet and you know you want all of these things. Just get the Shadow Systems MR920. This is the War Poet Edition. It's my favorite one, but they have others available as well. This is one of the few guns that has really good texture, but also has the thumb shelf on both sides, and you can really mitigate recoil really well with this gun. But if you don't have this gun, you're gonna have to send off your frame and get this done, or you could take some skateboard tape and put some tape up there. But say, for example, with this guy right here, there's not really any room for me to put too much tape up here, so that's why I haven't. Another way you could mitigate recoil, and I don't suggest doing this if you are new to firearms, but if you are fairly experienced and you don't mind going out to the range and troubleshooting and shooting a lot of ammo to make sure that they work correctly, is compensators and ported barrels. Why? Here's an example. This is an, a PSA build. <laughs> We're gonna put this in a video soon. But this is the Fax and Firearms slide, and I got a Fax and Firearms compensator on there. Uh, these little guys do wonders. I'm gonna have to do a new series on compensators soon because there's new ones that are available. But these dramatically improve recoil. Another way is to get a barrel that has ports on the top. To me, my favorite is with a compensator instead of the ports. The ports slow the bullet down, so you lose velocity when you have a ported barrel. Whereas with a compensator, it doesn't slow the bullet down. So that's the main difference between the two. Another way you could reduce recoil, if you, especially if you have a Glock, you notice this guy back here, that is a brass insert that adds weight to the grip of the gun. If you have any polymer handguns, you'll notice as you're shooting, for example, say your mag's full. So as you're shooting it, you're accurate, but as the mag gets empty, you start bouncing more because the gun gets a lot lighter as your magazine empties out. And so these little inserts right here, I do believe they have them for pretty much all Glocks. Different companies have them. I'll try to find some links over at the build list for you, but uh, these do wonders. They really make the gun feel good. The only people that I know that actually have these weights in their guns from the factory is Sig Sauer with their X5 Legion. These are really hard to find. I will try to find links to them, but you can buy these frames separately. So if you already have a P320 and a full-size slide, you could do that. Or if you have a compact slide with a compensator like this one does, you could do that as well. This thing is probably the epitome of shooting flat. Now, one of the arguments uh, for not modifying your gun is one could be legal, right? Uh, it's important that every single one of you that are watching this video today who are considering these things should look up lawsuits in your state. Look up your state laws. I can't do it for you. There's 50 states and there's no way I could do, I could tell you what all the laws are. California would probably be a state where you don't really wanna tweak it too much. Um, you know, a lot of those states, New York, Chicago, stuff like that. That is a concern, especially if your state or your county has specific laws against certain things. Like for example, I know in New York City that the police department has to carry like a seven and a half pound trigger. And to me, that just seems ludicrous, but that's the law there. The other argument against modifying a handgun or anything like that is you'll get conditioned to only be able to operate that handgun. And then if you go back to a stock gun, you'll be useless. And that's why I always suggest, if possible, if you have more than one gun, keep one gun stock at all times. You know, hopefully it's one that's very similar to the one that you carry. And then when you go to the range and you're practicing with your carry gun, bring this along with you and do some reps with it and you'll see the difference. And I can, I look at this like running with ankle weights and then I look at this like taking the ankle weights off. Modifications can be a crutch, but only if you allow them to be a crutch. But I will say this, if you have the proper technique down, it's gonna make a world of difference in your shooting ability, your accuracy and your speed. It's just facts. Sorry. So in the next video, we're gonna talk about holsters and belts and how to choose the right holster and belt that fits hopefully your body type the best. But moreover than that, we're gonna talk about kind of the pros and the cons um, to holsters and carrying a gun based on 
what size light you choose to carry and if you choose to carry a red dot because those will make a difference on how well the gun meshes with your body. Because remember what we talked about earlier in the video, it's about coalescing the gun experience with the holster, the belt, and how comfortable it is against your body, not just when you're shooting it. So if you don't wanna miss that video, hit the little subscribe button down below, hit the like button if you liked today's video, hit the dislike button twice if you didn't like it. But anyways guys, I love you and you guys stay sexy.